We don't know yet. We have ideas, but surely not only for transporting and construction of Ahu and Moai. If the Rapa Nui were worried about running out of trees, they certainly didn't behave like it. Knowing what I do about the ingenuity of these people in other aspects of their lives, I find it so hard to believe that they couldn't foresee such an obvious problem, figuratively cutting off the branch that they were sitting on. The more we uncover about the island's past, the clearer it seems to me that it wasn't the Moai that led the Rapa Nui to cut down their trees. And there's even less evidence that there was a civil war and a collapse of Rapa Nui society. In fact, the Birdman rituals suggest their cultural traditions were still evolving. But regardless, some deforestation did occur. So why did they do it, and did it lead to their downfall? What was it about their island that precipitated such a radical transformation? What makes Polynesia so fascinating is this tremendous environmental variation in the kinds of islands that we have. Big islands, small islands, islands that are in the temperate zone, islands in the tropics, coral, volcanic, and so on. So we have a kind of set of natural experiments, if you will, of the way in which the same culture, the Polynesians, adapted to and used resources on these very different kinds of islands. Rapa Nui is a volcanic island of moderate size, but it's way down in the southeast of Polynesia. So it's really getting almost into the temperate. It's subtropical to temperate. So the climate had a lot of influence. And the geology is fairly old, so the soils have less nutrients than they would on very young volcanic islands. So you have to have other sources of nutrient input uh, in order to sustain intensive agriculture. When the first king, Hotumatua, arrived on his double-hulled canoe with his new island starter pack of crops and animals, he would have found an island largely covered by this kind of dense undergrowth. So you can easily see that his first task would have been to start clearing the forest. In this respect, the Rapa Nui would have been no different to most other new colonists the world over. Slash and burn clearance for agriculture is the most common cause of deforestation and is still happening today in the world's rainforests. By felling and burning the trees, the Rapa Nui not only cleared more land to grow food, but enriched the soil with nutrients from the wood. Far from reducing the food supply, cutting down the trees would have greatly increased the island's productivity. The palm itself is extinct. It does not exist anymore, but we found these carbonized traces here coming from when the entire forest was slashed and remains had been burned. Charcoal was used for improving fertility of soils. We can date the charred wood to find out the chronology of deforestation. We took samples from all over the island and we found that deforestation started on the island about 1250 and ended roughly about 1650. Deforestation involved high labor efforts. We calculated from the number of about 16 million palm trees that at least 400 people daily were involved in the slash and burn activities on the island. Cutting down and burning the trees may not have been unusual. However, it seems to have gone far beyond what was necessary for agriculture. The various theories proposing statues, civil war, or just mismanagement to account for this are still hotly disputed. Relative to its tiny size, Rapa Nui has probably been the subject of more conjecture and speculation than any other place on Earth and still manages to draw together regular conferences at which some of the world's leading scientists argue over its past. Ultimately, whether we prefer one or other of the theories, or elements of all of them, the fact is the island ecology had changed. The local palm tree had become extinct. This is the Poike Peninsula, and it was the first area of the island to become deforested. The soil quickly degraded, 
and it appears that the Rapa Nui then abandoned any attempts to grow things here. The hillsides are scarred with patches of bare ground without any vegetation, where storm waters and runoff have washed the soil into the sea. But though the Rapa Nui gave up the fight here, elsewhere on the island they fared rather better. In fact, they showed remarkable resilience and a technical ingenuity that was easily the equal of their statue building skills. Their goal was to maximise and stabilise agricultural production, and they developed a method that allowed them to hang on to their topsoil and replenish its nutrients. The first Europeans to see this landscape would have had a very clear idea of what fertile farmland looked like. Back home, you cleared the land of stones and rocks for the plough to grow crops. These rock-strewn fields would have struck them as very poor land for cultivation, but they were wrong. These stones aren't the remnants of the weathered bedrock. Incredibly, they've all been brought here and distributed deliberately, and they have a dramatic effect on the land that they cover. The stone layer protected the soil from wind and water erosion. It improved the microclimate for the crops they planted protected the soil from the drying effects of the sun and deterred weeds. 300 years later, these stones continue to preserve fertile, cultivable soils on the land they cover. This was an ingenious solution to the effect deforestation had on the soil. It's a process known as lithic mulching. Lithic mulching or stone mulching is a very special technique which was invented on Easter Island in its kind, unique in the whole world. The stones now functioned as a protection layer. They compensated the loss of the palm trees, which before protected the soils against harsh weather conditions. Now the stones took over this function. In much the same way that the Rapa Nui were able to organise themselves to manufacture the statues and clear the land for farming, so too they worked together on the huge task of covering nearly half the island with lithic mulch. These people were no shirkers. We figured out uh, by calculations of the number and uh, size and weight of stones um, over that over about 400 years daily, at least 100 to 150 strong men must have been involved in this technique. I can see from this that it's entirely possible the Rapa Nui wanted to clear some of their island of trees, not to move the statues, but because they wanted to eat. Lithic mulching was not the only sustainable technique they developed to increase their productivity. The French botanist Jacques Barreau made a distinction between farmers and gardeners. A farmer grows a multitude of identical anonymous plants together in a field, but a gardener cherishes each plant individually. I like to think the Rapa Nui would fall into the second category. Another of their solutions to increase their food supply were little protected gardens they called manavai. A small low wall enclosing a circular space a few meters across protected a mix of crops, retaining moisture and providing shelter from the salt wind. There are thousands of these manavai, protected gardens, all over Rapa Nui, and they show that personal solution to the food supply. And there were other innovations in this landscape too. A hidden resource, unseen from the surface, are caverns formed by the collapsed roofs of the island's network of volcanic lava tubes. Sonia Hawa is a Rapa Nui archaeologist who has spent years surveying the island to document all its prehistoric sites. Without extensive tree cover, many of the crops that need shade to survive were grown in these caverns. 
So this has all been planted, then? It's all banana. It's a type of banana. Yeah? Yeah. And they seem to be growing very well down here. They're but, protected yeah, from the wind. Yeah. They have a protection, but also the nutrition of the rocks. And, and uh, they create, like, a, a, how do you say? Microclimate? Microclimate inside. And it's not only good for banana, but uh, you can put taro, uhi, tea, sugar cane. And how extensive are these caves? You can have uh, three or four kilometers of caves. And inside, they, of course, is, div is divided for different reasons. These caves are the inner landscape of Rapa Nui. They stretch under as much as 30% of the land surface. Accounts from Europeans who visited the island in the late 18th century often mention how few women they saw. Possibly that may have been because they were hidden in these caves for protection. But the most important role these caverns played in the well-being of the islanders was to offer them more variety in their diet. At the end, you can understand the relation of human with the rocks was very important. And, and their way of survive and using and using and using rocks. When you are isolated, you need to create, yeah? Because you, you have to survive. These people, they have to think like a rock, yeah? And they have to live with the rock. The sweet potatoes, yams and taro supplied the carbohydrates the Rapa Nui needed to support their labour-intensive agricultural practices. They seem to have had plenty of protein too. In addition to the chickens that the first settlers brought with them, they supplemented their diet with seabirds. The island had one of the largest bird colonies in the Pacific, though later overhunting would force the birds to retreat to the offshore islets. There was one other resource that the Rapa Nui could rely on, the sea. They could always fish the waters around the island. But even here, the particular characteristics of Rapa Nui didn't make it easy for them. Launching a boat is difficult on this rocky volcanic coast. Storms are frequent and the shore slopes dramatically into the ocean.